Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll discuss the problems and opportunities of evangelizing a post-Christian world. So please stay with us. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Paquin. and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guest, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle. And he, uh, of course, is famous for his doubts, but then also equally famous when he did see Jesus, he made an act of faith my Lord and my God. So he went beyond just the touch and went to a profound statement of faith that Jesus is Lord and God. And though he had doubted at one point, he became a tremendous missionary of our faith. He went over to what is today Iraq and founded the churches there. And then he kept going south and went all the way to southern India. Uh, there were communities of Jewish people living in India. And he went to evangelize them there. And eventually he was martyred uh, by being pierced with a lance. Uh, and it's very interesting that he would touch the mark in the side of Christ, pierced by that lance, later on died of being pierced by a lance. We want to uh, commend all of those who are St. Thomas Christians, the Chaldeans and Assyrian Orthodox, especially now because of the sufferings that they are undergoing in Iraq, but also the many uh, St. Thomas Christians in India, the Syro Malankara and Syro Malabar rites. Uh, God bless them, and uh, hopefully they will be as great evangelists as he so will we. Tonight we have a guest who is well aware of the challenges that come with the new evangelization, but he also knows that Blessed John Paul II challenged all of us to be not afraid. He is a member of the International Theological Commission and he is the bishop of the Diocese of Breda in Netherlands. So please welcome Bishop Jan Liesen. Bishop Liesen, it is a delight to have you here. Thank you so much Thank for you coming for so far from Netherlands all the way over here to America. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll enjoy your visit here. I enjoy my time in the States very much. Good. Yes. In, you know, I mentioned before the program started that Pope Blessed John Paul II has called, been calling us from early in his reign to a new evangelization of countries that had once been very Christian and have now fallen away. And just today I heard on the news, and so I went over to the internet and checked it out. Um, the battle lines were very clearly drawn as one group of pro-life supporters at the rotunda of the state capitol in Austin, Texas, were singing Amazing Grace, and a very famous hymn in right. this country. Yeah. Well, on the, right near them, separated by a line of police, was a group of pro-abortionists who were chanting vociferously, strongly, Hail Satan, Hail Satan, and repeating that as long as they sang the hymn, they chanted Hail to Satan. This shows that there's a difference, not only about politics, but there's a religious thing. And 
this tell us, you know, what the situation is like in Europe that you are called to evangelize again. Right. Let me begin by saying that I can only speak for the Netherlands. Sure. Europe is too big for me yes. to, to oversee. And even the Netherlands is, is not so small. Yeah. We have seven dioceses, four above the rivers, three in the south, and I'm one of the southern dioceses, southwest. So, yeah, the new evangelization is a real challenge to us. Um, let me recall for a moment that the new evangelization started or should have started 50 years ago mm -hmm. with the Second Vatican Council. Um, it's interesting to know, to note, and it was an American cardinal, Avery Dulles, who first noted that, there's a big shift from the first Vatican Council to the second. In the first Vatican Council, the word gospel appears just once in all the texts. Oh, Vatican I. Vatican I. To evangelize um, or evangelization doesn't even occur. But in second Vatican Council, the word gospel is uh, 157 times, to evangelize 18 times, and evangelization 31 times. So this clearly, clearly was the focus of the Second Vatican Council. But I think it's much, pretty much the same in the States as in Europe. After the Council, first attention was given to other things, new liturgy. Yes. Liturgy in, in the vernacular. Uh, we had a, um, a focus on sharing power. We had parish councils that did not exist before, diocesan councils that did not exist before. We had emphasis on ecumenism that was not so strong before. And all of these things are good, but not much attention was given to this central call to evangelize and to be evangelized. I, I would add that in that post-Vatican period, there was even one strain of ideology saying we should not evangelize. <laughs> I mean, obviously by people who had not read the documents, but people said, let everybody be who they are already. Very much true. That, that was here, I don't know about and, Holland. Oh, very much. I, I think that was worldwide. And they, ex they based it, or thought that they could base that, on the documents of Second Vatican Council. Somehow, the notion came alive that you could live your life and be a good person and you would go to heaven. You didn't need, you know, to go to mass every Sunday. Or somehow that notion crept in, in the church also. And this is not in Second Vatican Council. There is a small statement and an important one that God's grace is given also outside the church, that's true. Mm -hmm. But it also says that this is the exception and not the normal situation. And that in our society, which is very secularized, um, the conditions are not such that without the help of the sacraments of the church, you can reach salvation so easily. So well, without the help of the gospel right, itself. Right, right, right. And, and more importantly, even uh, I think to, to, with both of those, with the, the a de emphasis of the person Jesus Christ, of the Father and the Holy Spirit, as, as having a key role in our salvation and of every single person, this evaporated. You can only love what you know, and catechesis basically stopped in the 60s and 70s. Yes. I recall coming out of primary school that we were given our textbooks, our religion textbooks. We could take them home. Mm -hmm. You know, the books that we were so careful with all year, mm -hmm. at the end of the year, we could take them home because they were no longer needed and no new ones were bought. Yes. This was considered as, you know, we, we don't need that anymore. We will just speak about it. But there was no systematic instruction in the faith anymore. Exactly. And that is lacking already two generations. How can you love God 
if you do not know him. I remember when I was teaching catechism, uh, I was a college student teaching catechism to the grammar school students, and I was told, don't talk about the death of Jesus. Don't bring that in and focus on their experience. Don't, don't worry about teaching them doctrine. That was my instruction, yeah. and I listened yeah. uh, foolishly. There were two key words at the time. The one is uh, experience and the other is revelation. Actually, they rhyme in our language, mm -hmm. ervaring, openbaring. Mm -hmm. So you constantly heard about that, that of course we had revelation, but equally and perhaps more important was to have experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, people went with that. We had the new catechism in the Netherlands. It was very great on that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when it was presented to Rome and some corrections were made, nobody read them anymore. Right. And yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that when the, uh, I've talked about it in other programs, that when the Dutch Catechism came out, uh, there was a line in the early editions saying, well, the Blessed Trinity is such a mystery and too confusing, we won't treat it. <laughs> and so, so this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I think that was one of the corrections the Vatican wanted to have put in. Right. Yeah. But we we were told to use that yeah. catechism. I'm a little later. I'm, I'm younger, in other yes, words. Yes, so you are. <laughs> I never used it. Yeah. I don't know about it in, from personal experience, mm -hmm. but it um, it was used a lot. At one time, I served as a librarian in a seminary, and we would take in used books from deceased priests. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many copies of that Dutch catechism came in. Yeah. So it was widely used yes. at one time. Yes. But fortunately, I would almost say, after some time it just disappeared. Well, you know, ultimately, uh, I, I, when, in looking back, it was thin soup. Yeah. You know, it was, it was consomme. It didn't have exactly. any body to nourish you. So nobody was really attracted to it. Mm -hmm. It didn't feed you. Yes. And what people want and, and what the church exists for is to have this personal relationship with God through Jesus. Exactly. And that was not built up by that catechism. No, no. 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 So I was, I read scripture and I see that the first question that God asks after he created man, the very first question is, Adam, where are you? God is looking for man because man had, had become lost through sin. And God is, is trying ever since to bring him back. And that's a very personal effort of God to, to pull us back. And all of salvation history speaks of that. And then he sends his son. And his son speaks of his father and says, compares the kingdom of God to, to, to a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, one goes astray. Well, he leaves 99 aside and goes for that one sheep that has gone astray to find it. And there's joy when he finds it. And God is like the merciful father. When the prodigal son has gone and returns after repentance, he rejoices. The son that was dead, he says, has come alive. It's what was lost is found. It's not begrudging not at all. mercy, not it's at all. welcoming mercy. Now, and that relationship, that is what uh, we need. Yes. We, we, we need to be fed. We need to nourish our faith with a personal relationship with God. That we have to build up. And I think after the council, in our country at least, that was not the focus. The focus was on other things that were new and interesting, and so much attention was given to that. But good preparation for the sacraments, to really understand for a young child what it is to receive the sacred body of Jesus Christ, to commune with him in your heart, that was, you know, sort of disappeared, as if it was no longer important. And um, we are seeing the consequences. Yes. Yeah, the uh, vocations 
are considerably down in Holland, are they not? Um, now they are considerable down, but we had an exceptional situation in, in the Netherlands. Uh, just after the council, all seminaries, and there were 36 of them, major seminaries and minor seminaries, all 36 were closed down, all of them, at the same time. Well, but on purpose? By the bishops. Why? And they instead wanted to have a, um, they wanted to have theological faculties. You see, the seminaries were paid for by the church, but the faculties are paid for by the state. And the idea was, we Catholics, we pay taxes, so why should the education of our priests not be paid by the state as it is for the Protestants? So we would have theological faculties. But no provision was made for the students for a spiritual training mm -hmm. and formation. That was not foreseen. Students were sent out in the city and you know, find their way and go to the college, to the classes, that was all. So you can see from 66, 67, 68, the number of vocations in two years to zero, to zero. Then Paul VI, he appointed a new bishop in 72 in one diocese. And that bishop, that's actually an interesting story. He, um, before he was ordained even, the people of his hometown said, <coughs> Uh, what can we do for you? We want to give you a present. And he said, I want a new seminary. And then money came in. Not just 10,000 or 20 or 50 or 100, but it kept coming from the entire country. So he started a new seminary and students uh, came, seminarians from all over the country and there were, I was um, entered in 78, it was the sixth no, the fifth year of the seminary, there were 60 students. By the time I left, there were nearly 100. So this was flourishing, this was good. Mm -hmm. This was implementing Second Vatican Council. And there were vocations, and people really were praying for that. As a matter of fact, dare I say it, it was implementing the Council of Trent. Also, which had it, it was not abolished, of course. Yeah, right, that Trent had called for seminaries. And it's important to see that, you know, the seminary is not graduate school. It's a place of training priests for the pastoral ministry and not only, but not excluding the intellectual. Uh, so that to be kept in balance. It's in the seminary that I came to know the fullness of our faith and the fullness of sacramental life. Even though I grew up in a Catholic family, and we, you know, in summer, when we had time, we went to daily mass, but mm -hmm. throughout the year, every Sunday, mm -hmm. with the whole family. Even so, I had not, not I had no knowledge of everything, of, of, of an overview of the whole Catholic faith mm -hmm. that I only received in the seminary. It was an intellectual training, but also a spiritual formation. Yes. Yes. We had a spiritual director. I learned about the sacrament of reconciliation, and I cannot tell you how good that is. If you are 18 years old and you enter a seminary and you have never really experienced what that is because no one in your parish ever told you about it, a world opens for you. This is so important to sure. get this personal experience of Jesus who loves you and forgives your sins, mm -hmm. although you do not deserve it. This this builds up your faith and your relationship with Him. And that's only part of it. Then there is the way you read Scripture, not just as you know, an intellectual textbook that has so many interesting insights. No, it's God conversing with you and waiting for an answer. So all of that flowed into the formation uh, in the priesthood. And I think uh, that is what is necessary and what was lacking. And when you speak of new evangelization in Europe, this is what we need. And I also would add, it's not just the priests who have to do this and, and, and carry this and be sp spearheading it. Everyone. The call to holiness is for every person who is baptized. Everyone, each one. That's a whole chapter of Lumen Gentium. 
Exactly. The Constitution on the Church has a whole chapter called the call, call to holiness. Let me say some more on the situation in our country. Today I spoke with a person, uh, I forgot how we came to the topic, but I remember during that conversation how um, my father reacted. This was 68, 69. I was born on a farm and every evening we had the radio on. We needed the weather forecast for next day. Sure. So, um, but you would always get a little news flash because that was attached, the weather was at, forecast was attached to the, to the news. At one point, he got up as if he was stung by a bee and he switched off the radio. And he said, he is lying. And it was the cardinal who was speaking. It was the cardinal who was speaking and there was a report on the pastoral council that had started in the Netherlands after the Second Vatican Council. Now my father it was not a learned man, but he is a devout Catholic man and he knew his faith. And um, there was some moment in our church, sad to say, that also leaders, even bishops, also priests, did not provide good leadership. I'm sorry to say, but that's the truth. And without the truth, we cannot advance. We have to recognize that, that mistakes were made. And it's, it's very necessary to, um, if you want to evangelize, to have the truth. Um, Jesus is looking, he said, for people who worship him in spirit and in truth. If there is no truth, you cannot build up uh, the church, you cannot build up your relationship with him. It will fall apart if it's not grounded on solid truth. One of the things that I've often thought is many church leaders after the council were worried that, well, maybe people won't really like the gospel. <laughs> so if I can get them to like me and then they like the gospel because I like it, that may help to evangelize them. But the focus shifted. Well, do you think they'll like me? I recognize that. But, mm -hmm. you know, liking and liking, that has nothing to do with it. Let me tell you something. Yeah, I didn't say it was a good idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something about liking. Um, do this exist in America that you have a fair in, in town, you know, when, when there come merry-go-rounds for the yeah, children? Yeah, sure, sure. We had this every year at the patron feast of our parish. Okay. And we were given by our grandfather 25 cents. And we could spend those 25 cents as we liked. But the thing is, you can only spend them once. So we were going round on the fair with our 25 cents. What shall we spend it on? You cannot spend it twice. So we were careful in what we picked. What I see nowadays is that there is so much that people have forgotten how to choose. So they like this and they take it. And when they are done with it, they, they take something else. And they treat faith, they treat Jesus in the same way. They like him for a moment. So there's a parable that really appeals to them. They like it. And then after a while, well, he's sort of demanding and then they drop it. Liking is not a good way to, to advance, to grow. You have to choose. You have to make a choice and to love. There is a time in the gospel when a question comes to you a personal question and you can only give a personal answer and if you answer it you come away a different person uh, it's like the question when 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 you go to church with a presumably beautiful wife at your side and somebody asks you do you want to take such and such for your lawfully wedded wife that's a personal question if you answer that you walk away a different man 
Now, that kind of question is also in the gospel. And that is what we need to do. It's not just about liking, it's the whole package. We mm -hmm. choose Jesus because he has chosen us. In fact, we can only choose him because he has chosen us. And that's not liking, that's much more, much deeper. Well, this, th this is a problem that uh, certainly I come across in many marriages. Yeah. You know, that, oh, I, I really but like this guy. Is that not a sign uh, of but the time? Not anymore. You know, and so, you know, I'll, I'll switch to some other guy or I'll switch to some other gal. Uh, and, you know, it was fun having these kids, but I'm going to move on. And if they do that with their family, you know, it's not a surprise that they'll do that with our Lord. Right. But that's a sign of our time. And it's a sign that says, we need to do something, but this is not good. Mm -hmm. and, um, if, and I think this starts at an early age. This starts at an early age. We need, every one of us needs to be uh, formed in love. This is not something that, that we have automatically. You know, there is this, this romantic notion that people are all good by nature. Well, no. Yes, we were good and there is still goodness in us, but we are basically wounded in our nature. And uh, the one who dresses that wound with his love is Christ. We need him, even to be fully human. Mm -hmm. Even to love as human beings, we need him. Yeah. And this is, you know, something that is a, a primary part of understanding what we're trying to do when we evangelize. It's not getting people to like us. Exactly. It's not getting people to like our ideas, but it's getting people to be willing to be found by God the way the Lord God found Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes. Right. Yep. Be found by Him and accept the call He gives to come to Him. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is, I oftentimes mention, that's the difference between the Bible and philosophy. Philosophy is man's search for meaning, as Viktor Frankl said. Right. The Bible is God's, God's search, search for, for man. man. Right, exactly. Looking for Moses, looking for David, looking for the apostles, looking for Paul. You know, God takes that initiative, and then we have to say yes or no. Right. And what is very important in the new evangelization, I think when I look around in the diocese, is that we, we are careful in our language. Because without knowing, we use this secular language, and that's not suited. Um, at a press conference one and a half year ago, when I became the Bishop of Breda, I was in another diocese first, there was a journalist and he asked, Bishop, will you be the last bishop of this diocese? He was thinking, well, you know, the church is losing members so rapidly, it's gonna finish. So you're not that old, so you probably will be the last bishop. But if you take up that kind of vocabulary and start to reason in his line of thinking, you're already lost, you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. We have a holy, different message to give. We have words of love and hope and comfort, and we should not just get f fixed on this pessimistic outlook that others want to, you know, want us to, to consider or to impose on us. Again, as Mother, Blessed Mother Teresa used to say, God didn't send us out to be a success, but to be faithful. Exactly. And that's our task. You know, we're going to take a little break. I just want to mention that Bishop Leeson is also a contributor to the Come and See Catholic Bible Study. And their books and DVDs can be gotten at EWTN's Religious Catalog. So contact Religious Catalog, uh, EWTNReligiousCatalog.com, and you can look him up. You can see some of the teachings that he does. We'll be back in a couple minutes with your questions and your comments as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us.
answers these questions. Thank you very much and welcome back. We just uh, want to mention to you that um, our, these are a lot of nice folks here from all over the country. And we'd love to have you come and join us as well. If you have a chance to come down here to Birmingham, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. Or you can also go to the website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you information on the scheduling of masses, programs, information on how to get up to Hansful to pray with the sisters, and also information about places to stay and to eat around here. Uh, have some great Alabama barbecue and, and all that good stuff. I ate it today. Oh, there you go. <laughs> See? Uh, that's pilgrimage department. Good stuff. All right. You ready for some questions? Let's, Let's start them. off with Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Hey, Father Paco. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? I'm from New York. Great. Um, happy pre-Fourth of July to you all. Um, my question is um, just a question and a brief comment. Um, I'm just curious uh, for your guest and for yourself, uh, why do you think it has been historically, especially say in the last 50 to 75 odd years, Catholics have either been too shy, too afraid, too embarrassed, too evangelized in comparison with many of our uh, other Christian brethren, other Christian religions who are so zealous in um, evangelizing, and what advice or tips uh, you could give to us to help evangelize in our own small little way. Uh, thank you so much, and God bless you all. Thank, thank you, Miriam. And what do you think, say to that? Um, I was um, too young 50 years ago to know what was going on. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we can see now, looking back, that people were afraid, or at least were not focused on evangelizing. Um, I think that has to do with perspective. Let me put it this way. If you would, um, no, the number of attendance of mass in the, in the Netherlands, like 40, yeah, 40, 50 years ago, probably was, um, you know, 50, 60 percent of the Catholic population. Nowadays, it's like five or six percent. Now, how did we get there? Did somebody 50 or 60 years ago think that it would be possible where, as it is now? How did we get that? We got there step by step and we were there all the way. But when we are focused on just a small portion of the road, you do not see that you are on a slope, slope that's going down. You go step by step, but without the larger picture, you don't see any direction, you don't see where you're going. Perhaps it's not so much as being afraid to evangelize, it's just not getting your priorities right and being concerned with other things. And then what suffers is this. Also, as you mentioned earlier, if you don't train people in the faith, right. they're afraid to speak up because yep. they don't know what to say. And True. if they hear objections, True. they don't know how to respond. Right. Whereas, you know, certainly having grown up before you back in the 1950s, uh, we were taught how to give answers to things. And that was, uh, a, a matter of fact, into high school and college even, apologetics right. was taught. But then by 68, that was gone. Yeah. Something has changed though now. Yes. Like there is a group of uh, young teenagers or, and young adults who is preparing for the sacrament of confirmation. Somehow they were not in the system when their class in school had the sacrament. So, you know, they, they are gathered and they get their training together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I visit them and speak with them. These are people in college or young adults and they very much, in their situation, are asked questions by peers, by fellow students, by co-workers, why they are Catholic and why do they want to grow in that faith. And nowadays, they have the courage to speak out. And nowadays, they do find ways to deepen their faith. 
So there is something definitely changing that is happening. Yes. And I, I've known Catholics who do door to door evangelization. I knew a pastor, had 200 people in his church. And on his day off, which was Wednesday, he would go door to door systematically through the whole parish. It took him uh, two and a half, three years to go through the whole parish. And then he'd do it again. Right. And what he did was start bringing in 50 new members a year. So his church was growing by 25% just by doing that. But I would have a question for the caller. Like, what can you do? Yes. Or what can everyone here do to evangelize? Yes. Because it's easy to discuss it. Well, relatively easy to speak about it. But of course it becomes real if we start to contemplate what we can do. So this, this week, Will we have an opportunity to speak with someone about our faith? Yes. yes. We have it fairly simple. We wear a color. Right. So when I sit in the plane and I sit some, somebody sitting next to me, what denomination are you? You know, you strike yes. a conversation, exactly. you begin. Exactly. And I, there's not much I need to do, that, that goes. But what can you do? How can you, you know, speak of your faith? That is not so simple and you really have to, you know, think about it and do it. Exactly. That's where it starts. Matter of fact, uh, since she's from New York, I remember meeting a group of young adults who were evangelizing, handing out Catholic information in Times Square. Okay. And they gave one to a Jehovah's Witness. He said, wait a minute, I'm the one supposed to be doing this. You're Catholic, <laughs> not you. <laughs> Fix them. All right, right, sir, we have a, what, what's your question? Yes, thank you, Father. The question is, with evangelism growing in, in the church as it is, why is it in the mainstream media, liberal and conservative, we hear nothing but about how the Muslim uh, population is growing in uh, the United States, England, France, uh, other, you know, used to be Christian. Very interesting question. Because I know you don't know the United States, but no. what would you, you say about? The growing Muslim population? Well, well th what he's saying is that our media will oftentimes mention how rapidly Islam is growing yeah. and uh, never mention if the church is growing. Right, that's very true. But they will mention how many members the church has lost. Yes. And they will repeat that so that you will not forget. <laughs> and one of the things, sir, I would like to mention to you and everybody else um, is that on Al Jazeera television, they have been reporting over the last years that between six and eight million Muslims a year become Christian in Africa and hundreds of thousands a year in Indonesia and other places as well. So there is Oh, for the first time in history, mass conversion right. of Islam never happened before. Exactly. And this is reported in Al Jazeera with lamentation. Right. Yeah. Uh, they, have, they have mullahs talking and but saying this is bad. They report it. They report it. Right. The Western press does not. No. And I have suspicion about why. Well, if there is a huge event, Catholic event going on, like World Youth Day. Yes. In our country, typically, um, it will not be on the news, on the national news. Right. If there is a million or two million young people together for days in a peaceful atmosphere without tearing down the whole place, that will not draw any attention. Right. Put 50 hooligans together who, who tear down a whole stadium and that will have that will be covered on all stations. Same here. We That's had, media. Uh, th there were uh, a few dozen people who were maybe even a hundred or so who were protesting about gun violence, big news. At the same time, one and a half million people came to protest against abortion, barely mentioned. Mm. This is, we have to mention, the media is not a friend of the church, not particularly a friend of Jesus Christ. And so we have to be alert to that. Yeah. But media is something you have to be alert of, of and to use properly. Yes. 
so it's possible to use and to work with media, but you know, you have to know what you do and how you respond to the situation. And there are some things you cannot do with media. Yes. You have to know that. Exactly. We have another caller. Hello, John. Hello, Father. Hey, John, what's your question? Dear Bishop, you're a very loving man, so is Father Mitch. Uh, I wonder if you maybe have uh, a Dutch story for us about evangelization where somebody got blessed or somebody got changed, and also just how simple people can reach out to others in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'll hang up. Thank you, John. Okay. A Dutch story. Okay. <laughs> um, well, there are many. L l let me just pick one. Um, this is in the time when I was a, a professor in the seminary. Uh, in the weekends, I used to go around and say masses in the parishes to help out the priests. There's this one parish where a few women without special training were concerned for their children and their upbringing and their upbringing in the faith. So they started on their own, but they spoke with their priest to um, bring the children together on a Wednesday afternoon. That's a free time in the whole country. Wednesday afternoon, children are free. And to do um, basically uh, catechesis with them, but in a very playful manner. So there were three mothers and they were taken in all the children who wanted to come. And this was a good initiative because many people without interest in the church or the faith thought it was a good idea if their children were not roaming around but were taken care of. They did it so well and so lovingly that more mothers brought their children and stayed and began to participate. And children who had been there didn't want to leave. So that grew. And they were not just children aged 8 to 12, but they were 14 years old, 16 years old. It was growing. Some women simply started. A teenage group began. I have already seen young people in that group who got married, a Catholic marriage that came from there. Um, I have seen people, you know, that their lives were really touched. How do you evangelize? Basically, you begin where you are. You pray, and, and this is essential, because I, I know these women, and I can say this, they pray. They take time, the others don't even see that. They take time to go to Mass and to prepare themselves. Somebody in the diocese got word of that, and he said, tell us your method. We want to know your method. We want to apply it elsewhere. What, what, what do you prepare? What's your program? And you know what one of these women answered? I don't have a program. I just prepare myself. I just pray that if I am with the children, I may do some good for them. That's my preparation, I pray. That's and that works. That works. Let's have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? From my Florida. Good to have you. And what's your question? Uh, there's a new movement. I don't know how new it is, but uh, amongst uh, Catholic philosophers show the natural relationship between philosophy and theology. And mm -hmm. I was wondering how that is being used in the new evangelization. Yeah, so, so here we, uh, the, the, sh trying to get the importance between having philosophy and theology cooperate. Right. That'd be what they're doing? Show, show that uh, without it, Without a basic understanding of uh, the nature of things based upon its purpose, we don't have a coherent view of the world. Yeah, right. All right. Um, yes, we do need a coherent view of the world. There's many, many people out there who uh, are reluctant to be involved with the church or with religion because they think they have it all worked out. They have their worldview, they have their philosophy. Um, yeah, so as Catholics, it is important to have a coherent view of the world 
that is, um, how do you say that, congruent with faith, with theology. And um, maybe you should answer this question. I know you're working on a series about fides et ratio. And I know that there's lots of people who want to discuss. And when they have this readiness to discuss, that's an opportunity. And we should make use of it and speak with them and make ourselves available and discuss and try to see you know, where they are and reach them. So that is important. Um, and for that we need coherent thought. We need to be able to answer questions and to stand our ground when we explain the faith. We need that. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, I've been speaking about, because Blessed John Paul wrote about this in Fides et Ratio, is that much of the modern world, and I think that's part of what this gentleman is getting at, much of the modern world has lost faith in reason. Exactly, yeah. They don't know how to use reason. They don't want to bother to learn how to think. They'll accept scientific method without asking, why did you accept that? And they won't take other questions of philosophy, but like, why does the world exist? And therefore they ignore it. This is something that we need to reintroduce. There is nothing more dogmatic than a rationalist who have their uh, scientific method. That's an absolute. Yes. It's never questioned. Yes. It's a dogma. And they have no way of thinking outside that box. Yes. And this is the this is a challenge. Yeah. To you know, to engage them and to make them see that there is more than w what they can see in their rather narrow perspective. Yeah. But they think they have it all covered. Yes. And it's uh, and, and we certainly see that going on with the movement of new of, uh, atheists. Yeah. You know, that the, the, the new atheists um, are not really using good rational no. thought. No, correct. They're, they're, they're not of the caliber of the old atheists. I have seen shows on Darwinism yes. where they, you know, they dissect an animal and see how it is put together and they say, well, this is not a good plan. This cannot be the result of a creator. Uh, this is clearly evolution. And that's all they have to say. They, they, they don't uh, yeah. think further than that. And yeah. as if that is a kind of proof against creation. It's so simple-minded. Exactly. And uh, uh, th this is uh, uh, certainly, um, I would challenge them to come up with a better model. <laughs> Also uh, which true. one? Which ones of them have even created a new and improved uh, bird, you know, uh, and and that's better system, you know? They can work on strains of chickens, but they're using the basic equipment. Right. <laughs> the hens are still laying the eggs, not they. Um, yeah. Let's take another call. We have Linda. Hello, Linda. Hi, Father Pacwa. Hi. Where are you from? I'm from New York. Great. And what's your question? Father, I'm finding that even within the parish, people are needing evangelization. They seem to be picking up ideas from the other faiths that don't follow our Catholic teachings. I was at a function last Sunday, and we were talking about how some people are saying that it's okay for the homosexual marriage, women becoming priests, and I said, I don't think so. And they said, well, the Catholic faith accepts all people. And I said, yes, we accept them, but we, that's not the teaching that we give them. And I just find that even within the church, people need evangelization, and I'm not quite sure how to do it. I don't want to become argumentative or create bad feelings. I've had that happen in the past, and I try to maintain somewhat of a low profile, but it's, it's hard, because you want to speak up. Well, that's, you know, 
Uh, let's take let's take a look, Bishop. Why don't you start off with that? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, it's true that um, we accept all people, but we know to begin with that all people are sinners. And we're not just speaking of those who profess to be or claim to be homosexuals or whatever. We, we ourselves, we are sinners. Yeah. That's a basic fact. And we all need uh, repentance and conversion daily. Now, if there is this, this attitude, this feeling, this, this understanding that we take in everyone as they are and they are good as they are, that's not the Catholic idea of, of the church. It's not. The church does not exist uh, as a social club. We exist for a purpose, and that is friendship with Christ, friendship with God through Christ. And on God's terms. On God's terms, exactly, exactly. And we should not be shy to mention that. It, it, we don't need to, you know, to exclude people. Let, let me go back to a statement um, from St. Augustine. He once said, and it, it really applied to the situation of his day, when there were Christians who fell away from the church, and there were other uh, currents that were appealing to them. He said, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Now in later centuries, people took that in such a way like, you draw the line around the church. If you're out, you're out, no salvation. If you're in, you're good, salvation. I think a good way to understand the words of St. Augustine would be to see it dynamically. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. He's the center. So when somebody is in the church, but not going towards Christ, but going towards the periphery, he will go out. He will not be saved. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is outside the church, moving towards the center of the church, there will be a point where he crosses and will come in. So, yeah, we accept all people, right. but it's not about us who accept others. It's Christ who calls out for everyone to come to him. And that we want to make possible. And we, you know, we invite people, but we too have to come to him. Right. And, and I think with some of these questions, what we have to keep in mind is you have to help people think through what even is the purpose of marriage. Right. You know, is marriage primarily about how the adults feel toward each other? That's often on the way. Or is marriage and the marital act oriented towards the procreation of children? This is its purpose. And this is the, the other question that we have to deal with about using philosophy to help us think through what is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of the priesthood? And we have about 10 seconds left. Okay, so marriage cannot be just about feeling. Mm -hmm. if, if it were based on feeling, no marriage would last. Exactly. We have a heart, yes, and we have feelings, true. But we also have a mind and we have ratio what we have to use and to apply. One cannot go without the other. Right. Bishop, we're really out of time. I'm so sorry. I wish we had a lot more time with you, but hopefully you'll be back. Who knows? Uh, please give us your blessing. blessing. Which direction? Just right, right there. Okay. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and always remain with you. Amen. Amen. And we want to thank you and remind you that this network is brought to you by you. We can bring Bishop Leeson and all our other guests because you keep us going. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And we'll be able to pay our bills, especially during the summer. Thank you.